Uh, first, I want to thank everybody um, on the organizing committee, uh, particularly Janik, for inviting me and putting on such a, a great meeting. It's um, been very, um, I've learned a lot um, in these last two days, and I thank everybody for having invited me. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, some uh, more research aspects uh, that are going on in tyrosinemia, particularly using uh, animal models. But, and you have the handout here. I, after talking to some of you parents and the questions I heard, I decided to change my talk so it's not uh, what you have in the handout anymore. It's, it's different and uh, some of the things I want to address I think will be of more interest uh, to, to, the, to the families than what I had planned to talk about before. So um, tyrosinemia, um, obviously you know as a human disease, but it's had a really big impact. Uh, this disease has had a big impact on um, many fields in medicine, especially relating to the liver. It's uh, been used um, to study liver stem cell biology, gene therapy. I'll tell you a little bit, it's been useful to study malaria, um, hepatitis B, and so forth. And um, I'll give you a couple of examples of how the research in this uh, condition has really benefited medicine, medicine in general. So this all started um, with a very fundamental observation uh, and um, uh, Dr. Mitchell mentioned uh, Eliane Quitting in yesterday. She was a pediatric metabolist, metabolism doctor in Oslo, Norway, and she uh, made this seminal observation that she published um, in the mid-90s that most patients uh, with hereditary tyrosinemia that were liver transplanted um, actually have some healthy liver nodules um, uh, that arise spontaneously. And uh, Robert Tanguay and his group also have published on this in the French-Canadian uh, population. So here are some pictures. Uh, what you see in panel A is a liver from a child that had tyrosinemia and had a liver transplant. And the, the nodules that are stained brown are actually healthy nodules that make FAH and the blue nodules are uh, cirrhotic nodules that don't have FAH. So when Dr. Quittingen saw this, she wondered where, where do these healthy hepatocytes come from? And she took a, under the microscope, she cut out healthy nodules and sick nodules and sequenced the DNA. And what she found is that the healthy nodules, the mutation causing the disease had gone away, had reverted. And this is something that's been mentioned several times. It's, it's called reversion. And so, what we, when we saw this paper, we, we, we decided that um, the only way you could explain this is if healthy hepatocytes have a very strong growth advantage in a mutant liver. And um, to test this, we developed a mouse model. And um, at, uh, this is, I don't want to go into the details of how you make genetically engineered mice here. But um, in the early 90s, when we did this, this was one of the very first mouse knockouts uh, done for metabolic disease. And it's been something that I've built my entire career on. We still have these animals uh, in the lab. And I just, at this here, I want to acknowledge um, Robert Tanguay. Um, he cloned the FAH gene. Uh, uh, Daniel Faneuf, uh, and he cloned the gene in the early 90s, and without his cloning of the gene, um, none of this would have been possible. So, thank you, Robert. Um, so, what, so, we have mice that uh, have tyrosinemia, and just like humans, uh, they need NTBC to be healthy. And, but what we do, we're kind of naughty that way, uh, rather than letting them be healthy, happy mice on NTBC, we, we take the NTBC away and we do experiments to see what happens when you get uh, liver problems and tyrosinemia. So we did this experiment that you see here. We took healthy hepatocytes, liver cells from a normal mouse, and we transplanted them into an FAH knockout mouse uh, while it was on NTBC, and then we took away the NTBC. And this is um, what you see. So on the left panel, you see the healthy brown hepatocytes. This is a stain for FAH. Um, they, they engraft in the mutant liver, and all of the cells that don't stain, uh, stain brown have tyrosinemia. And then when you stop the NTBC uh, after three weeks, which is the middle panel, you see that the healthy cells have grown into little nodules. And then after six weeks, which is the far right panel, almost the entire liver has been 
corrected with healthy hepatocytes. And so this, um, what we can conclude from these experiments is that the FAH positive cells have an extremely strong selective advantage. We actually have some animals where the entire liver was um, reconstituted from, from one single cell. Um, you can get near complete liver repopulation and uh, hepatocyte transplantation can cure this liver disease if the donor cells have a selective advantage. Um, and many labs around the world, there's about 200 labs that have the tyrosinemia mice now in Japan, in China, everywhere in Europe, and so forth, that are using the tyrosinemia mice as a way to um, study liver cell biology. Now, the reason I changed my talk is because pa several parents mentioned this paper that was published uh, in Nature Biotechnology last year and said, oh, now we can actually um, cure the disease um, with this new Cas9 uh, genome editing technology. And I, I got the sense that some, some of you think that this might be a therapeutic option uh, for kids with tyrosinemia. So here are, uh, is a panel from that uh, paper. And it's, it's um, basically what was done is a, a, a tyrosinemia mouse was injected with a, um, with a vector, with a piece of DNA that has the healthy gene in it. And um, the technology has now become possible. It's become possible to cut the chromosome where the mutation is and splice in the healthy gene. And so that, this is what this paper was about. And in this, the panel that shows the weight uh, on the left, you can, can see that the mice that were treated that way, um, um, their weight recovered and they had normal liver function tests. And here's, here's some pictures. You can see in this FAH uh, mutant liver, you can see the brown nodules. Those are the healthy hepatocytes that were generated in that fashion. Well, we've been able to do this for 20 years using different techniques. So this is the first paper on gene therapy for tyrosinemia published in 1996. And you can see Robert on, on that uh, paper. Um, and what you see there in black and white, because in those days, you know, the, the papers were printed in black and white still, uh, mostly, um, you can see the healthy nodules. So it's just like the other paper. Um, the, the, um, the only difference is the technique that was used to correct uh, the hepatocytes. So in here, again, from those days, um, you, if you take um, uh, an FAH knockout mouse, off NTBC, they lose weight and they eventually die after about six weeks. That's the yellow line. The white mice are um, uh, wild-type mice, uh, normal mice that don't have tyrosinemia, and the red line are uh, uh, tyrosinemia mice that were treated with this uh, gene therapy method, a retroviral gene therapy, and first they lose a little bit of weight and then they start gaining weight. So they were essentially cured by this. And this is just for the aficionados, uh, the, the vector that was used um, to do this. It basically reintroduces FAH into the liver cells. And here is, here's the liver function test. So if you uh, look at the um, far right, you can see that um, the, the animals that received the gene therapy had normal transaminase, normal bilirubin. They were completely corrected. So the question then is, um, so the point I want to make is the recent Nature Biotech paper is not new in terms of the ability to do gene therapy for tyrosinemia. It's, it's been around for almost 20 years. It's just a more modern method. Um, and we, we could have done gene therapy for tyrosinemia 20 years ago, so, so why didn't we do it? Um, we, could, we thought we cured the mice. Why have there been no clinical trials for this? And this is the question I wanted to answer for you. And he, the answer is this. Um, when you treat tyrosinemia mice with gene therapy and you correct 90% plus, 95, 99% of the cells, they still get liver cancer. Uh, so on the far right, you see an NTBC-treated tyrosinemia liver, and on the left, you see one that we treated with gene therapy and then left off NTBC. And here's a much worse example. So this is a really bad... Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma in a tyrosinemia mouse that was treated with gene therapy. So this is a massive, this is all tumor. 
So how does this happen? Well, so here's a picture from a gene therapy treated tyrosinemia mouse, and all the brown uh, area is healthy hepatocytes where we've corrected it. This is a picture from 1996. But what I've shown you with the arrows here is that there are pockets of mutant hepatocytes that stay behind. So these mutant uh, liver cells, tyrosinemic liver cells, never completely go away. You can get 95%, 98%, 99%, but there's at least always 1% left behind. And I'll give you a, a quick answer in a second why I think that is. But they are sitting there, and the fumal acetoacetate is tr hitting those liver cells again and again and again, day, day and night. There's no NTBC, and eventually they turn into a cancer. So, um, unfortunately, tyrosinemia is a condition where I believe, and other people, um, that you have to actually correct 100% of the liver cells. 99% is not good enough. Um, and this is why a liver transplant is actually better than gene therapy uh, uh, in tyrosinemia. And that um, there would have to be some significant advances uh, for gene therapy to become um, safe enough uh, in, in, in for tyrosinemia patients. So e even though um, it seemed to be an ideal disease for, for cell and gene therapy, it's, I think it's too dangerous. There's an unknown risk of liver cancer, and um, we have an excellent medical therapy that you've been hearing about. Uh, this. So, so why do these mutant cells never go away? And I, I wanted to point out a piece of work that we uh, did again about 10 years ago and really surprised us. So, the, your common sense would be that if you have a sick liver, um, that, the ones that that's not functioning very well, that it would be more vulnerable to uh, stress than a healthy liver. So we were very surprised to find out that FAH mutant mice off NTBC are more resistant to liver injury than FAH mutant mice on NTBC. And here, here are two toxins we used. One, you may be familiar with the one on the right, Tylenol, acetaminophen, can be toxic to the liver. Um, the, the, the little triangles are uh, tyrosinemia mice off NTBC, and if you hit them with a real high dose of acetaminophen, it doesn't touch them. They're completely resistant. And then the, the little squares are the FAH mice on NTBC, and they die like a normal mouse does in response to acetaminophen. And on the left, you see there's a, there's a way to induce apoptosis in the liver with in, injecting an antibody that's sort of more for the scientists. And we saw the same phenomenon, the, the mutant uh, hepatocytes are actually resistant to cell death. Um, we proved this, um, so uh, on, you, you, if you, many of you uh, may be familiar with ALT as a measure of, uh, of liver cell death. Um, uh, if you uh, look at the yellow bars versus the black bars, the yellow bars are mice, FAH mutant mice off NTBC, and then uh, injected, and um, they don't have an additional increase in ALT. The same mice on NTBC are fully vulnerable to the liver toxins um, that, that um, normal mice are too. So, so basically, the few surviving mutant hepatocytes that remain around, they are really, really tough, almost impossible to kill hepatocytes. And that's why they are such a high risk for cancer. So cell death or apoptosis in tyrosinemia, uh, Robert will probably talk about this. He showed very nicely that fumal acetoacetate, when given as a shock acutely, causes liver cell death. No one questions that. But if you let it increase gradually, eventually the cells become resistant to cell death. And um, this is the situation we're presumably seeing in patients that haven't been treated or partially treated. Um, they, they're actually... Um, uh, more resistant to liver cell death than normal liver. So the, what's the clinical consequence? Um, so this, I haven't heard any of the other speakers mention this, so I want to make that point. So the liver disease in tyrosinemia is primarily uh, a disease of hepatic dysfunction, not liver cell death. And 
The way this plays out when you see patients is that they have very abnormal liver functions like blood clotting factors, albumin, bilirubin, and so forth. But actually, I saw it in one of the slides from our expert from France, that actually the, 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 the AST and ALT levels are only modestly increased. So that's, that's sort of a hallmark of tyrosinemic liver disease. You'd think as sick as they are that the AST and ALT should be through the roof, but it isn't. Um, it's, it's actually, and that's because the, the hepatocytes are not dying, they're actually just sitting there not working well. Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the point I wanted to make uh, for the physicians and families here. I need to see, how, how many more minutes do I have left, Guy? Okay, all right, so then, so then I will um, um, walk you through a couple of examples of how the tyrosinemic mice have been extremely interesting for liver biology. Um, I'm referring to these two papers that we did uh, many years ago, and they talk about uh, how we've learned from the tyrosinemic mouse how uh, regenerative the liver really is. And so this is sort of an experiment that's been uh, actually repeated by several labs, and it's really, when we did it, uh, uh, really surprised us. So we took healthy hepatocytes, but only a small number of them, 10,000. So that's, we're only replacing one in 1,000 liver cells. Um, and they put it into a tyrosinemic mouse, take it off NTBC, and as I showed you, the liver is repopulated by the healthy cells. Then we harvested the cells from that mouse and transplanted it into the second tyrosinemic mouse, and then from there into the third, and then from there into the fourth, five, six. So we did this seven times in a row. And from that, you can calculate the minimum number of times the liver cells had divided. And it was a shockingly high number. It was um, 3,000 to the power of seven, or two times 10 to the 24. So actually, the, 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 um, the, the, the liver cells were really dividing as if they were immortal. So from this, we now know that mature hepatocytes are actually close to immortal. They can divide well over 100 times, and some people now call them unipotential stem cells. And so this is a quote from that paper. Taken together, the results show that um, the, the mature liver cells are actually responsible and not a rare stem cell population. And for the sake of time, I want to move past all these stem cell things to something else that I think the families might be interested in, which is um, mice with human livers. So the, the tyrosinemic mouse has turned out to be fundamentally important uh, for the study of liver disease because it is possible to put not just mouse hepatocytes into these animals, but human hepatocytes. So human liver cells, of course, would be rejected. So we take, took the FAH knockout mouse and we crossed it with um, two other genetic mutations that make the animal uh, completely immune deficient and unable to reject human cells. And if you take human liver cells, not mouse liver cells, and transplant them, and again, they're stained brown here, you can see that a large percentage of the liver is now with human liver cells. And uh, that, this, this, this one was from the early days when we were not super good at this. This is what it looks nowadays. Um, we are routinely exceeding 95% liver repopulation. So what does this mean? This mouse really has many properties that normally a human would have. For example, the ability to be infected with a malaria parasite. So. Um, if you take one of these chimeric tyrosinemia mice with human liver cells and let mosquitoes bite it, they will get malaria. Um, normal mice don't get malaria, dogs can't be infected with malaria and so forth. So the Gates Foundation and other uh, researcher, malaria researchers are now using the tyrosinemia mice every day um, to, to, to work on new cures for malaria. And um, similarly for uh, viruses, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So these are human-specific viruses. Hepatitis C, there is now a good treatment for it, but hepatitis B is still not curable today. 
And so many, many labs around the world are taking um, tyrosinemia mice with human liver cells and them infecting them with hepatitis B to see whether they can find uh, new medications to treat hepatitis B. So just this is my last slide before I go to the acknowledgements. So what you see on the top is a way to measure viral DNA uh, or RNA um, in uh, DNA uh, in, the, in the blood of a mouse. And so what they took one of our tyrosinemia mice, they injected it with um, blood from a patient with hepatitis B. And the black line is uh, patient uh, is, is normal saline, so that's the control. And then you can see that after a while, after about a week or so, the, the virus starts dividing, replicating in the human liver cells, and that's the red and the green and the blue lines. And this is a log scale, so basically um, this is um, the, 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 the amount of virus in the blood is really quite high. And then after about three weeks, the researchers doing this study they gave the animals a drug that blocks the virus, and that's the red and the green line, and you can see that they were able to show that this medication works and represses the virus. It doesn't cure it completely. As you can see, it never goes down to the black, but it's just to show you that the mice can be infected with hepatitis B, and you can use the tyrosinemia mouse for um, for these kind of studies, to put this into perspective, in China alone, there are over 100 million people with chronic hepatitis B, and uh, 600,000 people a year die from liver cancer related to, tyrosinemia, uh, to um, hepatitis B in China. So this is really, um, the, the research on tyrosinemia has really provided a very valuable tool that will affect the lives potentially of many people. So this is uh, the group in my lab, that's the, uh, all of the people with the, with, the, with the green, with the arrows are people who work on uh, tyrosinemia or liver biology in my lab, and um, they've all contributed greatly to this work. And uh, once again, this is a real opportunity for me to thank Robert for all the groundwork he's laid for this, all of this molecular work in tyrosinemia. Thank you. J'inviterai Dr. Robé à rejoindre Dr. Morin comme modérateur pour euh, les questions de la salle au Dr. Grumpy. Uh, Dr. Parizeau, may I have a first question for Dr. Grumpy? For the audience, uh, may, uh, may you explain the finding of uh, Dr. Kittingen, the reverted nodules? What is the mechanism? Because one gene has been corrected. How can it happen? So um, again, Robert showed, and we've talked about how fumal acetoacetate uh, is damages DNA and it's mutagenic. So on the one hand, that's the reason why there's a high frequency of liver cancer, but it, it induces all sorts of mutations, including by chance mutations that correct the genetic defect. So it's 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 sort of a a uh, two-edged sword. On the one, one hand, you get liver cancer. On, on the other hand, the very high mutation rate can lead to self-correction. So it's, it's the fumal acetoacetate, I think, why there's such a high um, mutation rate that also can lead to correction. So if, if it hits FAH first and makes it healthy, that's perfect. But it's ob unfortunately more likely that it will hit some cancer-causing gene. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? All right, I guess I must have explained it uh, uh, really well then. <laughs> Thank you very much.